Hi there, this is Andrea York, and this, you're watching the Firecatchers uh, book club, online book club. Uh, we meet together once a month and discuss a book on worship flags and faith. And like last month, we have a very, very special guest. We have the author of A Living Canvas. This is the book we're discussing today by Ilsa Spears, and we have Ilsa Spears with us today. So welcome, Ilsa. Hi guys. Hi. How are you? <laughs> so, um, thank you so much for being part of us, part of this group. Thank you to Joy. Wave hi, Joy. Joy, who is um, who's an active member of the Firecatchers Club. She, we met a few months ago, and she was telling me about this fantastic book and her um this beautiful dancer worshiper that uh that i just really needed to get to know and told me about your book and i thought well we're gonna read that book for book club so thank you joy for recommending the book i really really have been enjoying um yeah. all it. now there's a story in it we're gonna get to joy joy's story is in there too she's got uh, a play and a part, of, a part of the book, and she also uh, did some of the editing, and we kind of discussed that already with, that Joy's already, she does have her hand in the editing of the book, so she has, she has, she gets some of the, some of the rewards of the fruit as well. Yes. So, um, so for Ilsa, I just want to start by saying uh, it is, it is a powerful book. It is, really a powerful book. I felt my, I felt so much worship just coming out of me as I was even reading it. And I was, I don't, I don't sing, but I was singing. I was making a joyful noise to the Lord all by myself <laughs> as I'm reading. And the song was just coming out of me because I, I couldn't go outside and worship at that particular time, um, which is what I would normally do. I would move, but I was, uh, worse. It's so it's just, it, it's such a, phenomenal uh, worship book, a book on worship, um, but it's really your story. So could you give us a synopsis? We'll start there and then we'll, I have lots of questions and other people might have some other questions too, but let, let's start with a synopsis of the book. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, it really blesses me because I had a lot of insecurity when I started writing the book. I had a lot of experiences that I went through um, and uh, I didn't quite know how to share it with people because I felt like I had so much to say and my husband often teases me says you know you talk a lot so I figured if I put it down on paper I don't have to do the talking and people can read it in their own time and a good friend of mine uh, Phil King, uh, he wrote a book and his book was is called uh, the purity of worship and he's a singer and um, he kind of goes from worship team to worship team and kind of teaches them how to flow and how to connect and um, so he's a good friend of ours and my husband actually helped edit his book. And um, so I got to read his book and that whet my appetite. And I thought, you know what, if he can write a book, maybe I can write something. <laughs> and so I started putting everything on paper and um, just all the experiences I went through, um, just as a child having a passion for dance, um, I felt like music was very um, pivotal or is very pivotal in my life. And um, I'm very cautious of what kind of music I listen to because I know of the impact that it has on me. And I'm very sensitive to it. And I see it now in my two little girls. I have a five and a seven-year-old and they're exactly the same. And um, so with the love for dance and the love for music, I just wanted to, um, to share how I've walked through life, the experiences I had, and I'm sure other people are walking through similar experiences and they want to know how can they use their gifts and talents and their passion and love for dance as a uh, outward expression of their heart of worship? Because I've seen a lot of worshipers, uh, particularly creative worshipers that have a desire to worship with the flag or to worship with fabric, but their heart is not quite there yet. The motive of their heart is not quite um, connected with father God's heartbeat. So it becomes more of a distraction than adding and enhancing an, a worship experience. And um, I wanted to share the revelations that God had shown me with that. 
So the book from beginning to end is started on the scripture in Psalm 51, 16 and 17. The message version puts it so well, where it talks about that a performance is nothing to him. A flawless performance basically is nothing to him. Going through the motions doesn't please him, but it's when our pride is shattered that we learn true God worship. And so my heart is about true God worship and how to connect. And so that's where it started. And then it talks about my story. So I want to say you, you mentioned God worship a lot, and that comes from the, me, the, the, the passage and the message. Yeah. That's the language that they use. And yeah. so how does, what does God, the term God worship um, mean to you? Can you explain it for the rest of us? Yes, absolutely. Um, I had to sit back and think about it because when you're experiencing it and you're doing it, you don't think about the steps you go through. So when I sat down and I pondered it, um, I'm big on the order of God in my life. Um, and to me, that's very important. So in my worship, I was trying to determine what is the order of worship? What are the steps to get into the order, the right order of worship? And to me, true God worship, what it meant to me was, is that when we step into the presence of Father God, the first thing we do is we behold him. So when we share our, uh, and pour our affections and our adoration and, on him in worship, instead of coming to him with a shopping list of what we want and what we need, the first thing we do is we come to him in true adoration, which brings us automatically into the order that God has, the godly order of worship. So we're basically saying, I put you first and foremost above anything else, and I'm going to sh shower my affections on you. The moment you start doing that, Father God already has your heart. And so he knows the desires of your heart. So he starts to share his affection and his love for you, which automatically pours purpose, identity, and, and, and passion and direction. So when he's pouring into you, there's this exchange taking place. You start out adoring him. He pours into you. You start getting all this purpose. And, and all of a sudden, you just want to step out and explode with an expression and that puts you into action. So for me, true God worship is, takes you through that process and it becomes um, pure. I have to unmute myself before, before I start talking again. Um, okay, so th thank you. I mean, you, that's the term that you use all the time or like throughout the whole book. So um, I just wanted to, to get that there right now for anyone who may be watching that it hasn't read the book just yet. Um, and this is, this is because we all use these theological terms and we don't always understand the, the, how it's being interpreted by that person. Um, so it, it's a little bit, um, it's not open to interpretation, but the way that it, it comes across. And so thank you for uh, clarifying that. Uh, I just, I have a, few questions I want to direct it a little bit, but feel free to, to share what's on your heart and questions. I'm going to just keep talking uh, until, until I see someone has a question. Is that all right? Uh, watchers, is that okay? Um, and like, I mean, right. Okay. So I started from the preface. I am like, Yep, this is this is the book for me. I started underlying and <laughs> dog earing it, and um, I love. I mean, right off the top, you said it is through worship that we can enter the throne room of God, uh, and I'm like, yep, this is my book. This is my book. And then you start with the introduction into, and you explain kind of what you just what you've just said. But worship brings breakthroughs. So I, what I love about this book is that it is your story, but it is not, it's about worship. Your story is interlaced with it and it's, a, it's slightly anecdotal, but it's not the story of Ilsa. It is the story of God worship. You also have to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. I mean, uh, don't, don't you feel that our life, we are created to worship, right? Yeah. So if we're created to worship, every aspect of our life and every step that we take should be an expression of that. So that, that's, I guess, 
I guess that's where true God worship is too, because he becomes the center of your life and all you want to do is worship and adore him. And it becomes a part of who you are. I mean, just washing the dishes, for instance. I mean, I find myself singing and worshiping and I have all these uh, revelations going through my mind of what I can do um, just in, just in the context of worship. Uh, a good, uh, there's a story in there of my friend, Phil King. He talks about how he would worship and he'd go and serve at the church, his grandfather's church. And um, he would uh, go and clean out the trash and work in the garden. And that's where he fell in love with the Lord was taking out the trash. You know, it wasn't on the platform singing a song. It was taking out the trash. So I believe it's a lifestyle. I actually dog-eared that because I, I actually, I hate cleaning the house. I, that's one of the things I loathe. Um, but I do every week because I hate a dirty house more than I hate cleaning my house. But um, I think that God redeems it because it is most often the most um, intense worship times. I'll be listening to either teaching or worship. And um, I mean, I know sometimes my house is little and my husband has come home and he sees like all of the furniture pushed away and he's like, what happened here? And then he'll see like a scarf. He's like, oh, yeah. (laughs) she was worshiping (laughs) um so it really is just lifestyle and it's about I mean one thing I actually would say I I would say that we're created for worship and I I would actually say we're created to know God and to know God is to worship him so it's kind of the same thing um because when you know him it's the only response really that you can have he is just that good and and the you said heart the heartbeat of worship this is still even this is still even in um the introduction is that you said that my worship is one of the ways that i build relationship i'm gonna ask you a question really quick (laughs) so that because you can hear the train um can you can you tell me a little bit more about how like that statement, my worship is the one ways I build that relationship. Um, would you say that that's the most intense way that you have discovered in worship, just worshiping? Yes. Um, for me, worship, I'm big about relationship. Uh, for me, relationship with people and relationship um, in general is a big thing. Um, it's important to me. So for me, when I, I've tapped into worship. Instead of talking to people about my issues, I would have, I took it to God in worship. And those were the intense moments that I've had. I mean, one of the stories in the book is the, where I was healed from bulimia. And it wasn't that I went into worship to be healed from bulimia. I wanted to know him more. I wanted more of his presence in my life. I wanted to have a tangible and life-changing experience that night. And when I entered into worship, the power of God came all over my body and I ended up um, having to be taken home because I wasn't able to, um, to get home because the power of God was so uh, strong on my body. But I felt like I was having an internal surgery taking place in my body, but I, could, I still didn't know at that point what he was doing. I just felt like that was the tangible presence of God and I my body couldn't withstand it. And so when I woke up the next morning, all thoughts of bulimia or anything that related to food didn't even cross my mind. It wasn't the first thing that came on my mind when I woke up and op- opened my eyes. And from just that one experience, I've had multiple experiences that the more I tapped into worship and the journey that he takes me on with the Holy Spirit, it's, it's a very exciting experience. Because every single worship encounter I have is different, but the same. It's, it's always um, going deeper, going wider, going higher, going, and it, it's uh, exciting. And so I look forward to where I get to worship more than I get to live in reality because I prefer that relationship building time with God in that environment. Um, and then backing it up and reading it with the word, because I like, I've, this is the second time now I'm going through reading the Bible in a year on my, on my Bible app. And it's unbelievable 
how amazing you you're reading all these things in the old testament and you, i'm feel like i'm living some of that stuff out in my worship all through relationships so I, that's how i feel in terms of the worship with relationship building that's so great so i'm gonna just jump around in the book that's gonna be a okay. One thought started to lead to another thought and I started to write down my questions and then I'd go circle back to something else that I had dog-eared. But I just actually want to circle back to what you had said about um, the struggle that you had with bulimia and how God actually supernaturally healed you. Now, was it something that you were pleading with the Lord to, like, were you trying to work through it on your own? Like, what were, what steps were you doing because at this point, like we know that you have a relationship with God and then you also know that you have this struggle that shouldn't be part of a Christian life. And then it, it also, so you, you have this dichotomy of there is a struggle. So were you desperately trying to leave it with the Lord and nothing was working? Like, like what happened in that whole experience and what did you try before the Lord just released you? Yeah, that is a compound. Uh compound question um i'll tell you this it had everything to do with control i think every person has an area of life uh, area in their life where they struggle with control and um for me being a dancer i'd been a ballet dancer since i was my mom stuck me in as early as they could take me so i think i was probably four or five and um I loved it. it I, I dreamt of being a professional ballet dancer and i was going to join a ballet company in england and uh, that was my goal. That was my passion. That was where I was going. But I had a, a, a I grew up in a very Christian home. Um, my mom and dad um, still together, strong, great, great uh, role models as husband and wife and parents. And so for me to have developed, I guess, or struggled with bulimia is kind of really odd. And it was because I opened a door. What happened was I was um, also doing karate. And I was doing it as self-defense in South Africa, where I'm from. At that time, it was very dangerous. And my mom and dad decided to stick us in self, um, into karate for self-defense reasons so that I had at least something to protect me if I ever ended up in a compromising situation. And um, so just my personality is when I start something, I try to do the best I can and try to exceed and get every accomplishment I can in it. And so I went for it, gung-ho. I was at my third, my third Q brown belt, the belt before your black belt. And I was an, in a karate grading. They were testing me. And I was going through a sequence of steps, and they were hitting me and trying to push me to see if I would fall over and if I was breathing properly, which is part of the testing that they would do. And the one blow came on the back of my shoulders, and they broke one of the vertebrae in my neck. And so... Um, at that point, too, I was one year away from doing my teacher's exam as a ballet dancer to where I could now have my own ballet school. And um, I was 16 at the time. And uh, when that happened, that fracture, everything in my life completely changed. I felt like I lost control of everything that I had worked toward for all those years. And because of that, I was scrambling, looking for some sort of control. What could I control in my life that I knew that was mine, that I could control? And I found it in food. And um, because I was so active and then I couldn't do anything anymore, um, I started to gain weight too. So I figured I can control this. I can control my mind. I can control my body. And so I opened the door at a young age. So I struggled with it, but I never admitted that I had a problem. I think that's where the pride came in. And um, I grew up in a good home. I was a good child. I wasn't very rebellious. Um, I didn't do, I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't do all the things that all my friends did. I was actually considered the holy roller friend. And um, the, the one that was really good and she never disobeyed. But I had a problem and it was my little secret. And it was my pride. And um, so I struggled with it for probably four or five years. And I didn't, still at that point didn't mention to myself or even let the words slip my mouth that I had bulimia. Uh, when we decided to move to the States, um, I thought, well, this is a new start. 
It's a new beginning. No one knows me. I can start afresh. I can make good Christian friends <laughs> and um, get involved at church. And um, hopefully I can get control over this bulimia to where I don't have to struggle with it anymore. And I got to the point where I realized it had control over me. I no longer had power over it. And so it got orchestrated um, a whole a kind of line of events. But within about eight months from when we had moved to the States, um, from meeting a few key people, um, uh, which, strangely enough, a South African evangelist was passing through town and he rocked up on our doorstep because he said he heard there were other South Africans in town and he wanted to meet who these South Africans are. And so he said, hey, I'm doing a meeting tonight. You want to come to my meeting and bring your whole youth group? So I said, okay, absolutely. I can do that. And we went there and all he taught on was faith, faith, faith. He was building our faith by giving us all these stories about all these miraculous things that happen. And he said, and tonight we're going to have the laying on of hands. And if you want more of this power of God, and if you want your faith to increase, that was the moment that I decided that's when I wanted to go up and receive more of God. And, but secretly inside, I said, God, I want you to use me. If there's anything in me, in my mind, in my mind, in my life, or things that I'm doing that is not, that is holding me back, that is being the, the door that's closing the opportunities that you have for me, I want you to remove it. Even if it's people, remove people out of my life that I don't need in my life, but I want to serve you. My heart is hungry after you. It basically boiled down to my heart. My heart wanted more of him, but I knew there were things in my life that were holding me back. And then when I finally said, okay, God, I want to touch, please, I need more of you. And then he just stepped in and he did that amazing um, surgery. Like it was a supernatural experience. Uh, I cannot describe it except for that. I felt like I had him with his, my hand, my, my, my abdomen was on fire for the entire night. And it felt like someone was churning in there. It was absolutely incredible. And when I woke up, I mean, I tested it. I was like, Surely I should be thinking about food. Surely I should be thinking about purging and, and, and binging and all this kind of stuff. And never crossed my mind. I had no desire for it. And things just started to click. And that's, I realized that my pride was the thing that actually shattered at that point. Andrew, can I jump in there? Are you muted, Andrew? Yes, sorry, please. <laughs> Okay, Ilsa, you were probably waiting for me to do this. The, what she's talking about on chapter nine, I would like to jump in there as a reader, as an observer. Um, she told you I was her first editor. Well, I have to tell you that when I got to this chapter, that this whole thing about uh, my pride shattered, that's what she's talking about. Ilsa's talking about my pride shattered. I want to tell you that as a reader, I was the first reader to get in there, that I was overwhelmed with the presence of God. I, I wept through this, and I am trying to edit her book, and I am weeping through this pages. And as a writer, she doesn't know what's going on. I am a t I'm, I'm typical of a reader that's going to pick up this a book. That chapter is so very powerful because when she talked about my pride shatter, I went through that experience myself on my own level. God shattered my pride. And as worshipers, we need to be humble servants and um, invite worship and, and for him to use us. But in areas I had no clue that God needed to deal with that, he came in and shattered the pride in my life by reading what she put out there. So I just want to jump in there and say that this chapter is extremely important. And if anybody's just gleaning through the book, do not skip that chapter because it's very important to the preparing of the worshiper's heart. It's very important to preparing our heart to be open and bare and pure before the Lord before we go out and we give anything to the body of Christ. So 
um, I just really want to jump in there. And that's just my take as the reader of this book. So I'm going to say I agree with what you are saying. It, it is, I mean, I think I was going to save this question until a bit later, but I'll ask, I'll even ask it now because it is so powerful. It is so, like I was saying earlier when I was, as I've been reading, um, just worship has come out of me. Like it, it, sometimes I just have to put down what you're doing and worship because, because that's, it almost, um, actually, I think like true worship is when you're in the presence of it, you almost feel like a voyeur, like when you're watching someone else, when, especially when you're watching someone else. So I was reading your story. I, I felt like I was a voyeur to your relationship with the Lord. And, um, and it feels like I, I've just been witnessing something so powerful that makes me want to participate and oddly I had this thought that what if we had more true worship in the church would pornography just disappear because we wouldn't need to be voyeurs of anything else but worship like it was just this powerful and what I love about your story is that we all have that same like a story like that that mm -hmm. something and and it wasn't that you try to be like when you moved to um, America, this is a fresh start. You can start again. You can do it on your own. And, um, but the reality is we cannot control sin it. And in, until the Lord actually he takes it out of us, the, the best you could possibly do is cope with it, which we don't cope well. But the most you can do is cope. But he takes it out of us, just like he did for you when you could feel it. And then you didn't have to think, am I healed? It just became not part of your thought process. Your, your thoughts were, were renewed. Like you, you weren't not thinking, don't think about food. You just weren't because your head was so full of, of God. And it's such a power, like what Joy is saying, it is so powerful because we can all be in that place in some point. Um, and that's the freedom that, that throughout the whole book, you talk that this is the freedom of, of worship, of getting to know him, of him getting to know us. You had um, a phenomenal, like chapter four is probably my favorite chapter, um, just simply because I think identity is my, is if I have like one, one, um, oh, I'd say one of my three main messages of my life is identity. And we have this identity flag collection coming out, which has been super powerful and also huge hurdles, huge hurdles to get this thing out. And, um, so actually this is one of the questions that I have for you is that not what, to get this book out and to put that out because it is so powerful and what Joy is talking about, your, your story um, in chapter nine, but all it's leading up to, uh, up to this, how it happened. Um, what was happening or what struggles did you have to go through to get this book out? Not, not your bulimia story, but the struggles to get the book out. <laughs> Joy's got something to say about that. She has plenty to say. <laughs> it was strong. <joy. laughs> yeah. I'm gonna handle this one, Leota. You wanna go ahead? I was at her house constantly. She handed me the manuscript chapter one. Miss Joy, I'm writing a book, would you wanna read it? And I went, Oh my god, oh my gosh. And she goes, Oh and I was so encouraged by it. I said, You gotta you gotta finish it. And then so she's, oh, well, I have another chapter. You want to read it? And I just kept coming to her house every week. Ilsa, you got to get this out. You got to get this out. And she's a mom with the little babies, and, and she's got to take care of them. And she had all these things about opening up her heart before people. And I said, Ilsa, you have to get this out. You have something inside of you that needs to get out. And she kept, and she was writing this nice, sterile book, Ilsa, and I said, no, Ilsa, I want the meat of your story. I want to hear 
how you got there. And when, when she started writing about her, her testimony about bulimia and so many things, it just, it just got so powerful, Ilsa, that you just needed a cheerleader. Go, Ilsa, go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Miss Joy was an awesome cheerleader. Um, you know how in, in the Bible it talks about, you know, Jesus says that his most powerful miracles didn't occur where in his hometown. It, it occurred everywhere else. Well, it's kind of like what I felt like when I was going through this book. Miss Joy, she was kind of like my outside of town and my home was my inside of town. And my husband was very busy at the time. And so he said, you know what I want you to do is I want you to put everything down on paper. And then he gave me this process of how to write because he was an editor of the newspaper at the, the university when he was in college. And so he says, there's this outline that you have to do that you have to follow and you have to loop this and you have to loop and loop and loop. And I had a terrible um, insecurity of my language skills because I think in two languages. So um, my first language was Afrikaans, which is a dialect of Dutch. And then I switched over to English because I was raised in both and I was bilingual in both. And uh, so when I moved to the States, I had to start thinking just one language is very hard. So when I would write things, I would not write it in the right tenses and so forth. And so when I give it to Miss Joy, she'd come back and she'd say, hmm, something's just not right here. What's going on? <laughs> and so she helped me out with that. So I struggled with that a bit. Um, Miss Joy was great in that. Um, and she was... Um, she held back a little bit and I said, no, give me the harsh reality, you know, tell me, is this going to even be worth the effort for me to do this? Because I have my little ones and I need to be a mom. I've got to be a wife. And I'm also working far away. My parents are here in Florida at the time I was in Louisiana and um, I have to work from home. So the challenges in putting it out was understanding how to not put too much pressure on my husband to where it would affect our relationship um, to get the editing done. But I had this burning need to get the book out because I felt like if I didn't get it out sooner than later, I was going to miss what I started seeing. God started um, unleashing in little pockets with some worshipers and creative worshipers on social media about a similar message. And I didn't want to be one of those um, I didn't want to miss that curve. You know what I mean? Like be right at the right time, God's time. And so I did go through some challenges personally in my self-esteem where I had to just tell myself, you know what, if one person buys this book and their life is affected and it's just one person to where they realize that it's worship is not about your identity uh, being in a flag or in a, in a dance or anything, but their identity is found in Christ and their worship is the connection that they have with Christ with the right heart and the right motive. If there was just one person that would get that. And even if I just sold five books ever, then I said, God, you know, it's got to be worth it. And um, I've kind of had that um, uh, motivation with anything I do. It's like, God, if I'm going to travel halfway across the road, uh, world, to go and do a, a three minute dance for opening up a conference um, and I've missed it. Instead of beating myself up and saying, you missed it, you spent thousands of dollars on this trip and you could have stayed at home and you could have done something else. I would rather take it as a learning experience and add it to um, what I should not do next time. You know what I'm saying? So um, yes, it may have been an expensive learning experience, but God actually ended up turning all those experiences for good, which I was able to then use as um, stories to uh, explain the worship, the heart of worship, because my heart is so passionate about the heart. Every worship is heart. Because I feel like if you hold back your heart from God, you're not going to get everything that he has for you. And that's being selfish to yourself. You actually, you jeopardizing and you sabotaging yourself. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting messages here. <laughs> I'll put my phone on silent. <laughs> People want to know how this, how that's going. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I want to come back to, that brings me to another question that I was kind of having, what you had said before, 
there, I, I will uh, often say and teach is that before you are a public worshiper, you should be a private worshiper. And I mean, I, I fully, fully believe that. Um, I will teach that when I, when I was leading a small, small young, like a middle school team of, of I, I would tell them like, we would actually go through just learning about the heart of God for six weeks before we even picked up flags. Like it wasn't so much that it was important for me to teach them about flags. It was important for me to teach them about connecting with God and then responding out of that. But what would you say, how do you, how do you say for the immature worshiper, like how do you, like there's, there, there's this, this period of time to bring in and it, and often it does start, in the flesh so how do we what would you how do you say what do you say to the worship leaders or the dance the the dance le team leaders that have immature people in their group and how do you bring them alongside with without squashing what god has put in them um giving them some because god also father god doesn't mind if we just play like we don't always get what we're playing at so how like how would you could you talk about what your thought thoughts are about that yes um that's a very that's a very good question um the best way i can do it is um my pastor from the, the church that we have moved from he always, he was actually the one that actually pulled me out publicly because I was a private worshiper. Um, and um, even when it came to flags, the first time I saw someone do flags, I thought being a dancer, I felt like if you use your whole body, why do you need a flag? But somehow God in his sense of humor ended up sticking flags in my hand. And he, he basically, you know, I said, ha gotcha now you know what flags are all about so um i've had some powerful experiences in terms of flags and um but if i'm talking to someone who is immature but they have a passion and a hunger to learn and they want to worship with the flags because they they in their own self discern that there is a shift in the atmosphere and that it does do something for their worship and it does um because miss joy was actually with me at a, a conference just recently in, in louisiana and they have worshipers like that. They are hungry and they, they are passionate and they, they want to do the flags and they do flow with the flags, but they don't have the etiquette. They haven't been taught the knowledge or the etiquette in that. Um, and I, there is a chapter in my book where I talk about the blessing of order, just like a, a musician and a vocalist has to audition for, um, for their positions in a band or whatever the case is. I feel strongly and I don't know, this is just a personal um, opinion, um, that flaggers and dancers should kind of be held to a higher standard in accountability just because they are, have a tendency to be more distracting if they are still um, new or immature in their worship. But even if they're new and immature in their worship but their heart is in the right place, I believe they will... The, the expression of their worship will be pure. Because I know, I, I know you guys will agree with me. You will be able to pick out who, who is real and who is fake, who is the worshiper and who is the performer. You can, you can recognize that all because of the, the heart and the motive behind what their expression is delivered as. So if I were to address leaders and newbies, I would, I guess, is just address the heart like you were saying the first six weeks just how you guys um just pulled out the heart of the father get to know who the father is um if they can in their private time just dig into his word get to know him and in their worship do that let their worship take them into the presence of the father so instead of just stopping at the door of jesus say hey jesus i'm here now i'm going to step through the, the door of jesus and step into the presence of the father and say father here i am and then go through the process of true god worship where you behold him and you pour out i believe when they start doing that that is where their personal growth will come too because god will grow them quickly my husband isn't a creative worshiper but he does paint prophetically and um when i met him he was a catholic 
um, non-practicing Catholic. He was just Catholic by name. And, um, and I had this preconceived idea of the man I was going to marry one day would be a seasoned minister. Yeah, because of where my maturity level was as a believer, right? So when I met this guy at a local restaurant and he had just walked up to me to talk to me, I thought, hmm, this guy's got other things on his mind and I cannot be um, getting myself involved with any of this kind of stuff because I have got to protect my heart, you know, and I don't want to make mistakes. And um, the first things he asked me was, so what do you do for a living? And I, uh, or, you know, what do you do? And I thought, well, this guy seems like he's really interested. So I'm just going to let him off very easily. And um, I'm just going to say, you know what? I'm an ordained minister of the gospel. And he's like, perfect. I'm trying to connect in my relationship with God. Maybe you can help me. And I thought, oh, well, now what? how am I going to get out of this? <laughs> Anyhow, um, it, was, it was a series of those kind of conversations. And, he's, and he just kept chomping at the bit. And I felt like I couldn't get rid of him. He was like a stray dog. And... Um, <laughs> So anyhow, in saying that to say was when he met me, his heart was in the right place. He wanted that relationship with God. He just needed the right keys, the right tools. And so I told him, I said, I would provide him with those tools in the form of a, a devotional. And I'd answer his questions if he had questions about the word. But I said, I am at, not responsible for your relationship with God. That's between you and God because I am not going to be held accountable for your relationship with God. So he said, okay. He says, I'm going to dig into the word. And he did. And with the faithfulness behind it. So he got to know the heart of the father through the word and through his worship. And then I drug him to crazy church. So he got a good dose of crazy church. And um, from that moment on, when he's like, I'm going to marry this woman. And, um, <laughs> and so that's what I would say is if their heart is right, if they're hungry and the leaders have the tools to teach them how to dig into the, to the word and get to know the father through their worship in their personal worship, then put them in a situation where they can start interceding for each other, put them in a, in a, a group setting and let them worship together with their tools, with their flags, with whatever their, their, their expression of worship is and let them start interceding for each other as they worship. So they're not so self-focused. They start lifting each other up in their worship. And um, that will also um, change the atmosphere because you have a group of accountability there as well. So you, you, you make mistakes in a safe place. You know what I mean? Okay. Sorry. Something came on the screen. Um, so in, I have this other follow-up question to that, that how do you teach? So it, actually in chapter three, I think is it, it starts. Um, today, I wonder if I had been more likely to recognize my gift if the question had been, what is your passion or what, what drives you and fulfills you? Do you think, so even when you, like with relating to the, well, to any of us, but those that are just maybe not, that don't have the maturity yet to step into something so so powerful as to be in front worshiping um do you think that 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 we as the church are asking the wrong questions when it comes to identity like that like are we asking are we are we are we asking the right questions to draw them out into their identity um as like as relate in a relationship with with the father and with christ um I don't know. Um, Ms. Joy, can you help with that one there? Andrew, can you state that one again? I, I, I don't think I got it. Okay, so do you, do you think that we're teaching, uh, are we asking the right question when it comes to uh, teaching the ident identity in Christ or identity in the Father? Are we, are we asking the right questions to draw the immature into the mature and into their identity? Well, um, Ilsa and I uh, teach a lot together. And um, one of the primary, primary ways of teaching or leading people in their, their identity is 
by leading from the front. And that's by example, that's by doing. And that's, that's actually like a, of a four step process of, um, of teaching anything, uh, leading and having other, others observe is primary. So I, I, is that what you mean? Like we, to, for, to lead them into their identity, we walk it out in front of them. And uh, by walking out in front of them and walking out, being confident in our identity in Christ and God has called us to do this in worship, that uh, it draws so many people to do the same. And Ilsa will totally agree uh, in all her workshops and in all of our groups that we've done together. It's by seeing someone walk out that confidence and that identity to passionately love God in this expression, no matter who is around or anything. It's, uh, it's what draws others in. So you will, that's how you will draw even the not, you'll draw a lot of novices and they are drawn in and you just kind of take them under your wings and you walk them through a, a, a disciple time and you definitely do not put them out front and um, allow them or encourage them to be on stage or in the front right away because it's just not a good place. It's, it's like um, the heart of the worshiper needs to be encouraged. But, but uh, say Ilsa, Ilsa's a magnet wherever she goes. She is a magnet. She gets those flags out and she is so confident and she is because of because you read her story here that when she gets into times with worship she just goes for it she's passionate and if anybody has just a little spark in there they are drawn to her flame and and that's how we should all be right andrea for sure yeah and and it's um and I think that's really what it is, is your story is, is drawing other people. It's ex, it's to me, worship, true worship really should be like what is described in revelation four and five. That first it was the, it's the four creatures around the throne and then it's the 24 elders and then it's the, the myriad of angels. And then it becomes all creatures on heaven and earth. Like it is, it, it builds because of the intimacy of what some experience and you br bring them in. And I would uh, just kind of, we're going to probably wrap it up now. We're, we're coming into the home stretch and I want to come back to, again, no, I'm not even pushing that the identity thing, but um, what God had said, has said about this collection is be on display. And that's one of the things that I want now want to bring, come back into where God is bringing into the creative arts. And you talk a lot about it is that, that he, that we're taking it back. Like really the enemy has stolen it from the church. There used, it used to be in the church and then we, then lies got in. And what the Lord has been telling me about this, this collection and, and this, this new kind of, season that we're going to is be on display but you have to be able to handle being on display that, that's where the maturity comes in we need mature people on display because truly it's not about us but we won't steal his glory but he really does want to he wants to show us off show us off to the world Exactly. Well, we as kids, you know, it's like you with your own kids. You're so proud of your kids and you tell everybody about them and you share pictures to the whole world on, on Facebook and you're just, you're so proud of your kids and no one's better than your own kid, right? And so that's the way I see God is and God's the same way with us. And yes, he does want us on display and it takes, I think, identity. You, I, you, I agree with you. Identity is, I believe, the key that is going to unleash the... Um, these create like the, the value of um, dry bones, right? Ezekiel 37. God is breathing life back into those creative bones again, right? And there's this army going to rise up and they are sick and tired of being shoved aside, being misunderstood, being judged 
because of a lack of knowledge in the church. And if and and it's for us who are mature to step up and say, hey, this is what the word of God says about a creative or about a flag or about just a worshiper. You don't even have to pick up a flag. You can tap your big toe for all I care. But that's a form of creativity for someone great. That is what God has expressed through them. So um, identity is key. And it's for the mature believers to stand up in confidence. If they are not confident in themselves, then they're going to lead a very weak army. So, and they have to communicate. I, be, I, I see this in churches. There's such a lack of communication and misunderstanding takes place. And then there's hurt people. And so they start blaming people when they should just um, communicate properly, be confident in their communication. And communication can be through your flags, through your dance, through your words, but communicate properly that you are confident and you know who you are. You're a child of the most high. And you know that he has given you a mission. Sometimes when I go into worship, I end up, for me, my worship, when I worship with flags, what flags does for me, apart from dance, is I go into intercession on behalf of the worship team. So I am supporting the worship team. I am praying. I am breaking. I am um, asking God to release his power for the Holy Spirit to flow, that they can understand that cadence of the Holy Spirit as he moves through worship for the creativity to flow and for the people to draw the people in because worship is not to be on just, uh, well, no, that's the wrong word there, to be a performance, but you are there to draw and you can only draw because you cannot take anyone where you haven't been yet. So you have to first pursue God so you can lead them to where you've been and then you continue to pursue, right? So, um, I believe in your confidence as you are worshiping and I'm interceding for that worship team with the flags, it really, um, it draws people in and that's where the immature, because we observe, we, we're humans, right? We observe, we learn by what we see and, um, it's not always by what we feel, but it's a combination. And what's so awesome about the creative arts is it affects every sense, it affects emotion, sight, feeling. I mean, it affects every part of who you are. And so you cannot say that you are not drawn in if the person's heart is pure. So I really believe that if we can just step up as mature believers, take the reins and stop being doormats, stop saying that just because you're a Christian and you use, um, I have to love everybody as an excuse for not to stand up for what is right and for what is proper. If we stop using that as an excuse and we stand up in righteousness and we um, deal with uh, issues in a loving, godly manner, we're setting boundaries and we are um, making people feel safe in those biblical boundaries to where they can exceed and they can excel and we can throw them forward and we can launch them into wherever God has directed them to go into, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about that. I wish that we had so much more time to talk because I mean, worship is worship, worship, identity, and love. Those are like my three things. And I wish I would just love to, you know, hear more of your story, share stories, worship. Be, I just want to actually worship. I wish we could worship together. <laughs> um, I, so we're going to actually just kind of wrap it up and like, I really do wish there was, I didn't have, I get to my, even all my questions. Um, I want to open it up to, uh, the others. Do you have anything that you'd like to, to say something that, that struck you today, tonight from what Ilsa was saying that resonated? I want to give you the opportunity to say a word, but not put you on the spot. He puts me on the spot all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to throw it out there that this book took me a really long time to read. And then I realized when I transferred my Kindle notes to my email that it was because I highlighted 35 pages worth of notes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that it's not stuff I didn't already know. It's the way you combine them together that gave me new thoughts. Okay, great. Yeah, um, trust me, it was very hard to put all that on paper and have to re um, to to make it try to flow. That's where my husband was so awesome and Miss Joy helped me with that because 
Um, I was, uh, Miss Joy teased me, she says, I would chase little bunnies here and chase little bunnies there and they try to keep me on track. Because it's very easy. I mean, even with um, the call tonight, it's very easy to go off and chase little bunnies here and there. But yeah, um, that is generally, it's a very, I, I personally feel like it's a hard book to read too because there is a lot. Um, it's it's multi-dimensional in a way. Um, so yeah, it's it's not just something that you can read and it's just a story. It's it's a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Jen, for saying that. It, it It is, I will, it has become, I would say that this is, this is equally a favorite book. I, there's one, Dance as the Spirit Moves by Heather Clark. I like that book and recommend it to anybody in dance and, and worship ministry. And I will recommend this book to anybody in dance or worship ministry. It is so powerful. I am, I am, I'm, I'm floored by how well it's written. And, um, it, it like, it reads, it, it, it's long. I can see why it's long because it is so rich, but it's, but it reads well, like it's written well. And I'm an, I was an editor before, so I'm always editing in my head when I read a book. <laughs> <laughs> badly written this is that was like what i said to the other author to candace last week I, or Matt, month i'm so glad that i actually really truly liked this book that i didn't have to edit it as i was reading hey, you're the kind of person that um intimidates me when it comes to that because i'm like oh there's going to be people who are editors that are going to read this book <laughs> but i but i enjoyed it like i i really enjoyed um i'm gonna um, I'm, I definitely will be just recommending this book. So can you, so again, I just want to say that this book is a living can, canvas. Um, and Ilsa Spears has been talking with us about her book. What a joy, like, honestly, what a joy that I've enjoyed this book. I've gotten to get to know you. Um, I already loved you since joy said that I would. So I, I have, as I've understood joy, whatever she says, I'm going to do because I just know that that's good. That's a good word. So from, from June, I've loved you already and, uh, and it, and it happened. And so where can, what's the best place to get this book and how can we, how can we find out where you are or what, what is up for you? How can people connect with you? Okay. The book is available on amazon.com. So that is one site that's available. There is a link on my website that will take you to Amazon as well. I do have a website and it's uh, my first and last name, ilsaspears.com. And um, so what I do on the website is I kind of just um, have a try to tie in a blog there of some other things that I do and um, also have a schedule on there where I'm going to be doing worship intensives or which conferences I'm going to be at next. Currently, it's slim pickings because we've just moved and I've kind of put everything aside. Um, the worship is more of a, um, a ministry that is, um, it is not my living. So it's something I do apart from what I do every day with the work that I have with my brother and I own a company in the alternative health field. So we manufacture minerals and stuff like that as well. So uh, for supplementation. So anyway, so yes, I have a website, ilsaspheres.com, and you can get the book on amazon.com as of now. And I'm Fantastic. hoping to do an audio book soon. Uh, oh, great. That's yeah. better for me because I, I do so much sewing that I am listening to audiobooks a lot. So I love that. Um, and Ilsa is I-L-S-E. I, we'll make sure that we have the links uh, in and around where we share this online and social media, and we'll put it on the Catch the Fire Worship Flags uh, website as well for for others to enjoy. Um, so I just want to pray for you, and we'll we'll close it out. Father, thank you so much for this little community of, of worshipers that you've put together, and how we've got to be able to hear from Ilsa, read her book here hear her story and it is just such a universal story and how you are you've drawn her you've drawn all of us into it and we all belong we all have a part there's a part um a beautiful tapestry and a beautiful dance and a beautiful banner that you are creating with all of our lives that we would that we would be as as you in the whole 
on the whole earth. And I just pray, Lord, that your blessing on Ilsa and her husband, Mike, and their kids um, and their new home as they are establishing what they're doing there, that you would build around her such a strong community of worshipers, of creative worshipers, that Ilsa would bring it in. Thank you for the opportunities that you're opening up to her just because of her sweet um disposition her reputation goes before her the one that you've allowed her to build that you've built for her her reputation um is that is so honoring of of order and of leadership um and then she brings in the proper um understanding about what authority is and that lord give to her even greater authority give to her even greater territory um that she would and you will because uh, because of how she's honored honor and how she honors the leaders and how she honors order. So bless her. Thank you for her time that she was with us tonight. Thank you for the women that were that were participating. Just bless them as they go about this weekend. Uh, until next time, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much.